Our Father and God, we thank you for today. Thank you, Lord, for the cooler weather and for everyone who's here. We do pray for those who may be on their way as well. And pray you'll teach us today, Lord, and that it wouldn't just be an intellectual exercise, but that you would really help us to understand your word, to understand how doctrines develop, sometimes change, and where they come from. And let that, Lord, set in stone the things that we know are true based in your word. So, Father, bless this time today. May you speak to us and teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Now, for those who don't know, my name is Michael. Uh, welcome to Zion's Hope Studio Electives. Uh, we do a lot of different topics in these studio electives, as you know, for those who've been here for, for any amount of time. But we usually think about our beliefs as being the only ones that really people hold to, generally speaking. You know, we're kind of shocked when we find out, oh, somebody believes something different. Oh, how could that happen? How could that be? What could happen there? Oh, no. And, <laughs> and this is particularly true when it comes to end times. And when it comes to the early church fathers, sometimes we're also shocked or surprised to hear some of the things they believed. Now, some of the stuff was good, some of it was a little weird, and some of it was like, how in the world did you get that? It just depends upon the time frame and who you're studying. But a lot of Christians, unfortunately, don't know what the early church fathers believed about the end times. And that's going to be our subject today. That's what we're going to look at. Now, there's, a lot, of course, a lot of things we can't go into, a lot of topics we can't address. I can't quote everything and everyone because there's just way, way too much. And if you have done any kind of study in this, you know there's a lot of writings in the early church that most people are not aware of. Most people haven't looked at. Most Christians haven't even studied. Well, many believers haven't studied church history and don't know church history. I know before I went to seminary, I learned a few things here and there, but I didn't really understand you know, how things developed or the councils and all this and all that. It's just, there's a lot to it. There really, really is. And we may not have studied about the councils of Nicaea or Chalcedon or anything like that or others in the early centuries of the church. We may ne never have even thought about studying these things. But it really is important to understand at least a basic understanding or get a basic understanding of what the early church fathers thought about certain beliefs. Also, too, many are not exposed to these kinds of teachings in their churches. And there's a variety of reasons for that, you know, and, and we won't get into that right now. But when we study this topic when it comes to the end times and the early church fathers, there are a few things we do need to keep in mind. Here's a few things. Some terms are similar to what we have today, but sometimes the meanings may be a little bit different. So be aware of that as you study, as you read, as you learn. You need to uh, do some digging to find out what they meant in their time based upon the terms and the words that they used. Also, too, there were some different words, different phrases that were used to describe the events of particularly the end times that we may not be familiar with. We'll look at a few of those today. But that's where you really need to, to, to look at these things and study these things. And you may, try, again, try to figure out where did they get that idea from? That's where you have to do a little bit more research. Uh, also, too, don't be surprised when you find out that they may have believed something different than you or held something different than you or used a phrase or terminology that just doesn't make any sense to us today in our, in our culture, in our world. Because remember, we're, we're talking almost 2,000 years. It's a different era today. It's a different time today. Language has changed. Culture has changed. And of course, theology in, in some ways has developed over time. Also too, just because an early church father believes something doesn't make it true. We need to recognize that as well. Because we know that we base our belief on the word of God and not on the word of man. The Bible is our authority. But it is good to find out what the early church fathers did believe about end times because they did speak about it quite a bit. But the first question is this. Why should we study the early church fathers? Why should we look at their views when it comes to end times? Well, here's a few things. One reason it is important for us to know these things is to see where various views came from. You know, when you study doctrine, it's good to see where things developed and how they developed over time. Now, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, how did it happen? Well, Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, coined that phrase. But it is a truth contained in Scripture. 
but the word was developed just to kind of summarize that belief. Also, when we study this, challenges us to evaluate and sometimes reevaluate some of the things that we believe. Second, we need to learn about them because a lot of prophecy teachers today quote them out of context to justify their own positions. That is, they will use selective quotes to justify their own beliefs, and you need to be aware of that. So again, this requires us to do a little bit more teach, a little bit more learning, a little bit more understanding. So you need to do your due diligence and even check out what I say. All of us. All of us. We all need to check out and be discerning and go to the Word of God to say, okay, well, what does the Bible say about that topic, right? It is also important to know what was going on in history in the early church, politically, religiously, economically, all these things. Because aside from the persecution mentioned in Scripture, like in the book of Acts, Christianity was basically outlawed until Constantine. Now, some of the Caesars were more lenient than others, but some hated Christianity with a passion, and the persecution was great. So we need to understand that the writings in the early church primarily were written within the context of persecution that was already occurring, already taking place, already happening. They were not at ease in Zion like we are today in the West. And remember, they wrote after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD. And they still referred to future events that were going to happen. And that's important to recognize that too. So put these things within the context of history as well. Now, there's going to be a reference I'm going to quote from called the Didache. Who here has ever heard of the Didache? A few of you. Okay, a few of you have. Well, the Didache is the earliest Christian document outside of the Bible. It is an extremely important document. It means teaching sometimes called the teaching of the twelve, or the teaching, you could say it that way too. It was roughly written between 60 and 130 AD. There's some you know, variation within that time frame. And just to give you a frame of reference, the Apostle John wrote Revelation roughly between 90 and 95 AD. So we have this additional Christian document written around the same time as the Apostle John was living, or shortly thereafter, compiled then too. So this Didache becomes a very critical document when it comes to the early church and for us today too to understand. The location where it was written was either Syria or Egypt. There's some discussion when it comes to that. But this was known within the early church. They wrote, referred to it. This was like a manual or catechism for Christians. You know, they would go through this before, before somebody was baptized. You know, this, this was a very important document when it comes to the early church. Now, what we're going to do today is talk about four different topics, four different topics. So I know we wish we could talk about more, but just for sake of time, there's only gonna be four. And I will be reading more than usual because I'm, I'm just gonna go to their quotes, look at their quotes, and maybe explain a few things as we go. I will do my best, I hope you don't get bored. <laughs> you know, so I'll try to keep, keep things going as well, as fast as and quickly as we can. Now we don't have time to go into everything and every one. You do have those references there. You can go and look up the individual or the writing or the topic uh, a little bit more. When you do have more time, you have the references there on your notes. And I do have them up here as well, just so that you can see where those go. So, are you ready to go? All right, here we go. The first topic is this, the Antichrist. What did the early church fathers write about the Antichrist? Well, before we get to the quotes, I do want to go to Scripture to give you a foundation for some of the topics that we're gonna look at. First of all, 1 John 2.18. Children, it is the last hour. And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. And John wrote this in the first century. Now the first one I'm gonna quote is from the Didache. It says this, watch over your life. Do not let your lamps go out and do not keep your loins ungirded, but be ready. For you do not know the day or the hour when the Lord is coming. Meet together frequently in your search for what is good for your souls, since a lifetime of faith will be of no advantage to you unless you prove perfect in that very last. For in the final days, multitudes of false prophets and seducers will appear. Sheep will turn into wolves and love into hatred. 
For with the increase of iniquity, men will hate, persecute, and betray each other. And then the world deceiver will appear in the guise of God's Son. He will work signs and wonders, and the earth will fall into his hands, and he will commit outrages such as never occurred before. Again, this is a quote from the Didache. Again, this early Christian document, Didache 16, 1 through 4. So that's one reference when it comes to this topic. The next one's going to be the Epistle of Barnabas. So the next one's the Epistle of Barnabas, and it says this. The final stumbling block or source of danger approaches. We take earnest heed in these last days. For the whole pastime of your faith will profit you nothing unless now in this wicked time we also withstand coming sources of danger as becometh the sons of God. That the black one, the Antichrist, may find no means of entrance. Let us flee from every vanity. Let us utterly hate the works of the way of wickedness. Now the epistle of Barnabas, by the way, was written roughly between 80 and 100 AD. So again, it was a very early Christian document. And he said that. Now, these writers exhort the readers to stand firm during the persecution they're facing so that they will endure the suffering but also be prepared for when the Antichrist comes. That's the reference here, particularly in this one, what he's going to be talking about. And this is true. You know, one reason that God allows or brings difficulty into our life, among other things, is to strengthen us, to strengthen our faith, to strengthen our resolve, to toughen us up. Who here has been in the military? Anybody been in the military? Yep. Now, do you go in and they automatically just give you a gun and say, here you go. Do you go in and just say, okay, well, okay, you're, you're in the military now, now let's go to combat. I hope not. <laughs> no, you're trained. You go through basic training, then you go through specific training, how to use the weapons, how to stand, how to, how to move, how to, how to march, how to, how to become the soldier that they want you to be. And one of the reasons God brings or allows difficulty into our lives is to make us into the soldier he wants us to be. <coughs> He's toughening us up. The suffering in our lives gives us the opportunity to strengthen us internally. Now, we don't always go through that. We don't always fulfill that or, or, or that. But listen to this. The crisis of today prepares us for the greater crisis of tomorrow. And that can go with anything. Personally, politically, worldwide, nationwide. And the persecution today prepares us for the greater persecution tomorrow. And it is coming. When difficulty arises in our lives, remember this. The Lord is training us as a soldier is training and preparing for war. Because we are in a spiritual battle. We are in a war. Now we know who wins in the end. But there's still battles we will all face. And sometimes we will fail. And sometimes we'll be victorious. All by God's grace. And that's what's going on here. Now the next quote is Justin Martyr. He lived roughly between 110 to 165 AD. So I'm kind of going in sequence so you can see these things. He, Jesus Christ, shall come from heaven with glory. And when the man of apostasy, the Antichrist, who speaks strange things against the Most High, you can see the Daniel reference there, shall venture to do unlawful things on the earth, against us, the Christians. Hmm. Again, Justin Martyr, 110 to 165, that's his dialogue with Trypho. Here comes another one, Irenaeus. Uh, roughly 120 to 202 AD is when he lived. And they, the ten kings who shall rise, shall lay Babylon waste and burn her with fire, and shall give their kingdom to the beast, and put the church to flight. Now that does not mean an airplane, of course. <laughs> Again, against heresies, 526.1. Here's some more. Tertullian, I mentioned him just a few minutes ago. 145 to 220 AD. Heresies at the present time will no less rend the church by their perversion of doctrine than will the Antichrist persecute her at that day by the cruelty of his attacks. Prescription against heresies, 4. Hmm. Next one, another Tertullian. And that beast, Antichrist, with his false prophet may wage war on the church of God. Tertullian again, 145 to 222. That's on the resurrection of the flesh, 25. 
Now there's some references I've used here. I do want to thank Alan Kirshner for his research on this. He's done a lot of great stuff. Of course, Marv has a lot of these, some of these quotes for regarding the Antichrist in his book on the pre-wrath rapture, which I recommend to you. Uh, but there's, there's a lot more than most people realize when it comes to this. Here's another one, Hippolytus. Aren't you glad we don't have these names anymore? Yeah, yeah. Hippolytus, 185 to 235 AD, says this, when the times are fulfilled and the ten horns spring from the beast in the last day, the last times, then Antichrist will appear among them. When he makes war against the saints and persecutes them, then may we expect the manifestation of the Lord from heaven. That's his commentary on Daniel 2.7. Next one, Cyprian. This one's a little bit longer quote. He was roughly uh, living between 200 and 258 AD. Nor let any of you, beloved brethren, be so terrified by the fear of future persecution or the coming of the threatening Antichrist as not to be found armed for all things by the evangelical exhortations and precepts and by the heavenly warnings. Antichrist is coming, but above him comes Christ also. The enemy goeth about and rageth, but immediately the Lord follows to avenge our sufferings and our wounds. The adversary is enraged and threatens, but there is one who can deliver us from his hands. Again, Cyprian, 200 to 258 AD, his epistle 55, 7. So we have uh, quite a bit here regarding the uh, Antichrist. What can we learn from this? What can we learn from this? Well, here's a few things. The early church fathers within the few first hundred years all agreed the church would encounter the Antichrist. I just read you a few references. There is no hint of the church escaping persecution. Remember, they were already within persecution at the time. But they still said, something's coming, someone's coming, and we need to be prepared. This also shows the early church fathers, of course, based on the Bible, state that the persecution of the Antichrist begins actually halfway through Daniel's 70th week. Or this seven-year period, commonly but incorrectly called the Tribulation. Another one. This also shows that the Antichrist persecution or the Great Tribulation, as we would define it, is not the day of the Lord. It is not God's wrath, Amen. as is commonly misunderstood. There is a difference. There is a distinction. But something else we see here is this, reality and hope. Persecution's coming. Antichrist is coming. But look to Christ, because he's coming too. There's always that hope there, or often that hope there. So we cannot lose sight of this. These leaders did not shrink back from telling the truth. And boy, do we need leaders to do the same thing today. They did not compromise the truth, but they said, be prepared, you're going to be persecuted, he's coming, get ready. But they also said, you know, we need to watch over our lives. I didn't really read those references, but you read that. And they talk about, they say, you know, being perfect, but be mature. Look over your own Christian walk. How is your maturity doing? Are you growing in the grace and the knowledge of Christ? Not just with end times, but with other doctrines and other teachings as well. Live a life that honors the Lord and look to Him during times of difficulty and persecution, and that still speaks to us today. And it will speak to us more, I believe, in the future in America, as it does to many Christians around the world today. So there's the Antichrist. Next, the Great Tribulation. Now again, we're gonna look at this, this scripture first. The basis for this is uh, Matthew 24. Look at a few verses here, 15, 16, and 21. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which is spoken of through Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. For then there will be, what? Great tribulation. Such has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. So here's the basis for the great tribulation. Of course, it's the words of Jesus himself. But what did the early church fathers believe? This again is from the Didache. So again, the early Christian writing. Then shall the creation of mankind to the fiery trial, and many shall be offended and lost. 
But they who endure in their faith shall be saved by the curse that may be Jesus, that may be a reference to him because he was considered a curse because he was hung on a cross. Then there will appear the signs of truth. First the sign of a stretched out or spread out in heaven. Then the sign of a trumpet's blast at the last trump. And thirdly, the resurrection of the dead. Though not all of the dead, but as it has been said, the Lord will come with all his saints with him. Then the world will see the Lord coming on the clouds of the sky. Again, the Didache 16, 5 through 7. It's kind of like a chapter, even though the chapters are kind of small, but verses 5 through 7. So we see this here mentioned within these early Christian document. Now, this may seem a little bit fuzzy, you know, kind of the timing, but we're not really talking about that. But we see a parallel within the Didache with what Jesus said in Matthew 24. Do you pick up on that? There's, there's, read, read the Didache, these verses, go back and read Matthew 24, you'll see a parallel. You know, false prophets and signs and events and all these things taking place. You know, read what the Didache says about these false prophets. Love changing to hate, remember what Jesus said? The Antichrist arising through the abomination of desolation, Paul says that also in 2 Thessalonians 2. Then the signs occurring, the resurrection, after the Antichrist persecutes the body of Christ or the church, Christians. Then the world will see the Lord return. So it kind of sets a time frame or a framework of end time events. But here's some more quotes. Again, the shepherd of Hermas, 95 to 150 AD. Happy you who endure the great tribulation that is coming on. After 70 AD, they, these guys weren't preterists. And happy they who shall not deny their own life. Vision 2.2, again, the shepherd of Hermes, Hermas. Again, Irenaeus. And therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, it is said, there shall be tribulation such as not been seen since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous, in which when they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. Irenaeus 120 to 202 AD against Heresies 529.1. One more. Hippolytus, once again. Now concerning the tribulation of the persecution which is to fall upon the church from the adversary. That's pretty clear, <laughs> by the way. The Antichrist. That refers to the 1,203 score days. Half of Daniel's 70th week. During which the tyrant is to reign and persecute the church. Hippolytus, 185 to 235 AD. Treatise on Christ and the Antichrist. He dealt with this specifically. 60, 61, then 60 through 67. This great tribulation, the, the pressure, the persecution or antichrist wrath, they say, is coming. Be ready. Be prepared. These leaders stated the church would go through it. Again, the consensus is what this was going to happen. And we cannot ignore this. So whatever your view is of end times, these things cannot be ignored. You cannot just dismiss it. There's too much. Now we may wonder, well, where do they get some of those teachings? And that's another topic for another time. But there are some things that are very, very clear, as I mentioned in these quotes. They were already undergoing persecution and yet still awaited the great tribulation that was to come and the Antichrist who was to come and the return of Christ. They were still looking forward to these things though they were going through great difficulty at the time. Again, we cannot ignore those things. So that's the great tribulation. Next topic, the rapture. This, of course, is when Christians are caught up in the air. And that's based on 1 Thessalonians 4, 4 13 through 17. Let's read that. But we do not want you to be uninformed or ignorant, brethren, about those who are asleep, that is, those who've died in Christ, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain or survive until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So we shall always be with the Lord. Indeed, amen, amen. Now, what did the early church teach about this topic? Let's look at a few quotes. Irenaeus, 120 to 202 AD. 
And therefore, when in the end the church shall be suddenly caught up from this, you saw this quote a minute ago, but now I've highlighted this part. It is said there shall be tribulation such as not been since the beginning, neither shall be. For this is the last contest of the righteous in which they will overcome. When they overcome, they are crowned with incorruption. What is that? We get a new body. Our bodies are glorified. That's the incorruption. Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15. Again, Irenaeus against Heresies 5, 29 and 1. Next question, or next uh, reference, rather. Tertullian, once again. Now, the privilege of this favor being alive when Christ comes back awaits those who shall at the coming of the Lord be found in the flesh, who shall, owing to the oppressions of the time of Antichrist, deserve by an instantaneous death. Well, what is that? Rapture or translation? And which is accompanied by a sudden change. For we shall not all sleep, we shall be changed in the moment in the twinkling of an eye to become qualified to join the rising saints. And just in case you're wondering, as he writes to the Thessalonians, <laughs> he's referring to Paul's letter here, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. Tertullian 145 to 220 AD. Again, on the resurrection of the flesh, 41. So we see this once again, very clearly. Here's another one from Tertullian. In the crisis of the last moment, and from, from their instantaneous death, that's how he described the rapture, while encountering the oppression of the Antichrist, these persons will undergo a change. They obtain thereby not too much a divesture of the body as a clothing superimposed upon it with the garment that is from heaven. Meanwhile, the dead, for their part, will also recover their bodies. Over their bodies, they too have a garment put on the incorruption of heaven. The one group puts on this parable when they recover their bodies. The others put it on as overcoats, for they indeed hardly lose their bodies. That is, when there's the rapture takes place, we're going to be transformed. We're going to be changed like that. And he wrote that in 207 AD, by the way. And then you can see the reference where I got that from. Hmm. Another one, Cyprian, 200-258. And this... As it ought always to be done by God's servants, much more ought to be done now. Now that the world is collapsing and is oppressed with the tempest and mischievous ills, in order that we who see that terrible things have begun and know that still more terrible things are imminent, may regard it as the greatest advantage to depart from it as quickly as possible. <laughs> Amen to that. If in your dwelling the walls were shaking with age, the roofs above you were trembling and the house now worn out and wearied, were threatening an immediate destruction to its structure crumbling with age, would you not with all speed depart? If, when you're on a voyage, an angry and raging tempest by the waves violently aroused foretold the coming shipwreck, would you not quickly seek the harbor? Lo, the world is changing and passing away, and witnesses to its ruin, not now by its age, but by the end of things. And do you not give thanks to God or give God thanks? Do you not congratulate yourself that by an earlier departure you are taken away and delivered from the shipwrecks and disasters that are imminent? Again, Cyprian 200 to 285 in his treatise 7.25. So, this is just a few references to the rapture in the early church. Now, this rapture or being caught up was taught in the early church. We see the references here. Now, they use different terminology than we do but they thought of it as a change, as resurrection, because it is a resurrection, or death. Now, some don't say when it's going to take place, but again, when you put all these quotes in context with other things, they say, well, the church is going to encounter the Antichrist before the rapture. The persecution is going to happen. The difficulty is going to be there. And Tertullian's reference in particular is extremely clear. So there's a little bit more about the rapture. Now, I do want to talk a little bit more about this, though. Some will say these references affirm a pre-tribulation rapture view. But again, when you look at it in context, that's not what they were talking about. That's not what they said. Cyprian said, oh, he used the word eminent. He's not talking about the return of Christ. He's talking about more terrible things that are coming, more persecution that's coming. That's what he was referring to. Also, too, he used various examples, a house falling apart, a, a ship getting you know, caught up in a storm. That is, when you're in the difficulty, what are you doing? You're looking for the escape that's coming. 
And during the time of the Great Tribulation, during the persecution, what are Christians going to be doing? Looking for Christ to come and take them away. That's what he was talking about. So these things are very, very clear when you look at them in context. But also today, where do you look? Where do I look when difficulties arise? Do we look to our bank account? Do we look to our education? Do we look to our political leaders? Do we look to maybe our pastor? Or do we look to the Lord? Now, yes, we should have you know, strong fellowship and a good church where we attend and can look to, for guidance for the leadership from there. Yes, I understand that. But we have to look to him. We have to look to the Lord himself in the difficulties that are going to take place and are already taking place in your lives and mine, whatever they may be. So that's something we can also learn from these kinds of teachings. Last topic, the millennium. Now, Christians have looked at the millennium in different ways down through time, down through history. In the early, early church, <laughs> the physical or literal 1,000-year reign of Christ from Jerusalem was called the millennium or chiliasm or, chiliasm or the chiliest view based on Revelation 20. So let's look at those verses real quick. Chapter 20, Revelation 1 through 6. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who's called the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones. And they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hand. That's the mark of the beast. And they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. Amen to that. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Mm, amen. Now, a little bit of history here is in order. It's important to understand this. Between 66 and 135 AD, there were the Jewish-Roman wars. Again, AD 70, Jerusalem and the temple were utterly destroyed. Titus and his army came in there. They, they leveled the, the, uh, the city and the temple. After 135 AD, the Jews were forbidden from coming into Israel except for Tishbiav. Remember what uh, occurred roughly 132, 135? The renaming of Israel to Palestine to insult them, to try to erase the memory of the Jews being in the land. Now, some of the early church fathers did believe in a future kingdom or millennium into the third century of the 200s AD. But as you see, I'll show in some of these quotes, that kind of modified, that changed over time. First, Eusebius. Eusebius, he was an early church uh, historian. He's studying uh, Papias, or Papias uh, again, an early church father. He said this, among these things, Papias says that there will be a millennium after the resurrection from the dead when the personal reign of Christ will be established on this earth. That's pretty clear. <laughs> you really can't deny that. Again, you, quoting Eusebius, citing Papias, 120 AD. Another one, Justin Martyr. I and others who are right-minded Christians on all points are assured that there will be a resurrection of the dead and a thousand years in Jerusalem, which will then be built. So Jerusalem, he says, is going to be rebuilt. For Isaiah spoke in that manner concerning this period of a thousand years. Again, Justin Martyr, this was roughly around 160 A.D. Hmm. So we see that there was this belief in a millennium, belief in the 1,000 years, and more. Here's another one. Also, too, please note that the word kingdom is here is used by Irenaeus. This is the millennium. They, would, they say the kingdom is the millennium. In the times of the kingdom, the earth will be called again by Christ, and Jerusalem will be rebuilt after the pattern of the Jerusalem above. Said that about 180 AD. So less than 100 years after the Apostle John. Another one. This one is going to be a little bit different, but I want you to note the time frame. 
So these other ones were in the 100s. Here's one from 280 AD. This is Victorinus. They are not to be heard who assure themselves that there is to be an earthly reign of a thousand years. They think like the heretic Serinthus. For the kingdom of Christ is already eternal in the saints, even though the glory of the saints will be manifested after the resurrection. Again, Victorinus, 280 AD, and you can see the reference there. Hmm. Interesting. Well, what can we learn here? First of all, most of the very early church fathers for the first few hundred years did believe or embrace the millennium, the literal 1,000 years reign of Christ. This is the kiliastic view that Jesus will rule from Jerusalem for 1,000 years. Now, some did not hold to this. Most of them came later. Well, why is that? Remember Victorinus' quote. Now, there's a few reasons this changed, and I did a, a message uh, some time ago on uh, the views of the kingdom. Three-part message. The last one I did, the third one, shows the transition from a belief in a literal millennium to the spiritualized millennium, or kingdom, back to a more literal kingdom after the Reformation, particularly with the Puritans and other things and pilgrims and, and other texts. You can look at that on, on our YouTube page. Uh, but you can see how that changed, but it mainly changed when Origen, you guys ever heard of Origen? Yep another early church father who lived in the 200s or 3rd century, he ended up allegorizing the scriptures. And that, of course, was passed on to the next generations, Augustine and others who also spiritualized the scriptures. And they understood the Jewish temple had been destroyed in 70 AD. The Jews, again, were kicked out of Rome. There was a lot of problems there. And in the minds of those in Christendom, after a few hundred years was this. There has to be an explanation for what's going on. Well, the Jews killed Jesus. That's where that came from. That led to a spiritualization of the kingdom, a spiritualization of the millennium. That it's right here, right now. Oh, we're in the kingdom. Well, I don't know if you looked around the world, but if this is the kingdom, whoo, we're in trouble. Uh, this is not the kingdom by any stretch of the imagination. Now, we have some of the spiritual blessings, but the kingdom is still yet future. So as we finish up today, Gone over a lot, I've had a lot of quotes here. Hope I haven't put you to sleep. But we can learn about a lot about the end times just from what the early church fathers said. What they embraced. But we also see how eschatology did change over time. Particularly in the latter 200s, 300, and then of course into the time of Constantine and more. Most of the early church embraced what's known as historic premillennialism. You can look that up and, and do your own study on that. So why did I do this study, other than being interested in the topic? <laughs> Here's a few reasons. I wanted you to know a few things about what the early church fathers actually said about end times. I wanted you to be informed. Again, this is not exhaustive. There's a lot more that could be shared and shown and everything. But I wanted you to see what these early church fathers believed about these four topics. Ones that we're all interested in. But I also wanted to give you a biblical basis for each topic. And I want to stress that. Everything we believe must come from the Word of God. Things about salvation, about Christ, about the triune nature of God, about grace, about faith, about end times, about everything needs to be foundational in the Scriptures. Third, I wanted you to be equipped to share these things with other people. That's why I gave you those references. So maybe you're a teacher, or maybe you talk about this with all your friends. You've got the references. You can show them. Hey, you want to know what they believed? Here it is. Show it to them. Show it to them. Fourth, there are practical things that we can learn as we've gone over when it comes to these things too. The early church lived with the expectancy of Christ's return in their lifetime. Are we doing the same? We know there's going to be difficulty coming, but are we looking forward to him, waiting for him, to make all the wrongs right. <laughs> Not just in our life, but worldwide. Because there's a lot of things that have gone wrong. But even more importantly, how is living with the expectancy of Christ's coming changing our lives today? It's one thing to expect his return. But it's quite another to say, why is that important to me today? In the situation I face. In the difficulty I'm facing. In the blessing he's given to me and all these things that are taking place, how is that changing me today? 
I want to close with one more quote. This is also from Cyprian. I think he summed it up very well. For you ought to know and to believe and to hold for certain that the day of affliction has begun to hang over our heads and at the end of the world and the time of the Antichrist to draw near so that we must all stand prepared for the battle. Nor consider anything but the glory of life eternal and the crown of the confession of, to, of the Lord. And not regard those things which are coming as being such as were those which have passed away. A severe and a fiercer fight is now threatening for which the soldiers of Christ ought to prepare themselves with uncorrupted faith and robust courage. Considering that they drink the cup of Christ's blood daily for the reason that they themselves may be able to shed their blood for Christ. Cyprian, 200, 258 AD, Epistle 55, 1. Just so that you know also, here are the references that I had, the Christian Classics Ethereal Library, Eschatos Ministries, pre wrath Resource Institute website, a Dictionary of Early Christian Beliefs, the sign, you can look at that too, New Advent website, that's a Catholic website, but they have quotes from the early church fathers, the pre wrath Rapture of the Church, of course, again, Marv has all those quotes in his book. But as we finish up today, Again, I want to encourage you to go to Scripture, to know what Scripture says, not just about end times, but most important about salvation itself. It is not by works. It is by the grace of God. And we can only endure life and the difficulties and the persecutions we face by the grace of God. Let's close in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for these early church fathers who really codified the summarized summarization of the end times. And for those who hold the pre-wrath view, we can see the connection. And for those who may hold another view, they may be challenged by some of these things. So Lord, I pray that this was an encouragement and equipping session, uh, but also a challenge for some of us to really understand that these individuals live with the expectation of this happening. And they recognize, of course, ultimately, that Christ will return. So Lord, help us to live in reality, but also in hope. And may we live in that hope every day and may you change our hearts, change our lives, keep our eyes on you. For your glory we ask in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Go deeper in your understanding of God, His people, and His plan for planet Earth. Zion's Fire magazine is an exceptional resource with powerful insights from Scripture that provide a clear understanding of God's ultimate plan for the last days and the return of Jesus Christ. As a first-time subscriber, you'll receive a free one-year subscription to Zion's Fire magazine with no strings attached. Request your free subscription by visiting our website or by calling our toll-free number and we'll send you six free issues, one every other month, for a full year. We depend on the generosity of viewers like you to support the ongoing production of these programs. Your donation, whether large or small, is greatly appreciated. Donations may be given online at www.zionshope.org or by calling us toll-free at 1-888-781-9466. Stay informed and see the latest from Zion's Hope by liking us on Facebook, subscribing to our YouTube channel, and following us on Twitter.